So explain why you decided to, to resign. Sure. So let me start off by saying this is absolutely a, a personal decision for me. It was really difficult for me. You know, I don't mean to project my own values and the limits of my own conscience on the entirety of the federal bureaucracy. Right. So let me first say that there are thousands and thousands of federal employees who did not make the same decision I did. Um, and they are absolutely working to prevent this freight train from going off the rails and exploding. Okay, so respect for them. But, and I think this was the, the real, kind of one of the core messages of my op-ed. Um, if you're a concerned American and you're hoping that some unelected official somewhere or a cabal of civil servants somewhere will resist this president and fight his policies from within the government, then you will be disappointed. You never saw any resistance or deep state? Uh, I certainly saw people's personal reservations. Uh, I never saw a deep state. Um, that's right. Uh, what I did see was people kind of really weighing this thing. And if I, if I can use an analogy, um, working as a diplomat overseas, as a foreign service officer, feels kind of like you know, watching your home from a distance. And so you know, even under the prior administration, and I mentioned this in my op-ed, um, I absolutely could see visible cracks in, in the walls, maybe even the foundation of our nation, or our government at least. Um, the past three years have felt like the house is on fire. And not only is it on fire, but there's a man purposefully lighting more fires. And so, you know, when I see, when I talk to my colleagues, it's not that they don't feel the same distress that I do. They absolutely do. It's not like they're not as concerned as I am about that house on fire. It's not that they don't have compassion for the people in that house who are being hurt. It's that they decide to keep their distance and hope that the house is still standing afterward. And for me, that is the definition of complacency. You, in fact, say that there's no deep state, there is a complacent state. That's so right. explain, I mean, because look, uh, civil, uh, foreign service officers uh, are working for the American people, they're working uh, representing America overseas, they're not representing any particular administration. The, there's an ambassador who's appointed, usually sometimes it's a career foreign service person, sometimes it's uh, some donor who knows nothing but is given a lot of money, um, and yet, Plenty of people serve overseas in administrations they don't like, they don't agree with the policies, but they faithfully execute uh, the policies as is their job. That's absolutely true. So is that complacency or is that um, service? So uh, let me come back to that particular question. But what I'll say is I, I've thought about this for a long time, you know, at least two and a half years, not more than that. Um, and what I'll say is I rationalize it to myself using the same words you used. You know, mm -hmm. I swore my oath to the Constitution. You know, I serve the American people. I don't swear an oath to a particular president or a particular party. Um, and that's true, but that's really abstract. Um, so when you read the commission of a foreign service officer, of a diplomat like me, you'll see that it's written there explicitly. We serve during the pleasure of the president. And so what that means is the way we serve the Constitution, the way we serve the American people, is by working for the president that they elected. And right now, that president is Donald J. Trump. So did you, um, were there specific events or in the United States or specific policies uh, that you just felt you could no longer essentially be the face of in a foreign land? Um, you know, there's, a, a, there's no single kind of straw that broke the camel's back. There was the slow buildup, um, and maybe I'll call it moral distress, kind of with each successive kind of tweet or action. I mean, it started with the Muslim ban, the executive order in January 2017, um, and then defending white nationalists after Charlottesville. Um, it was family separation. It was revelations about squalid detention centers. It was, was it just yesterday? federal agents kicking down doors and arresting parents on their children's first day of school. So what's different about this administration for me, and I only worked under two, but you know, at least in my lifetime, I've seen a number of presidents. 
What's different is kind of the naked, unapologetic cruelty. That's the first thing. Um, the second thing is, you know, the, the sheer kind of managerial incompetence. Uh, of this administration. The rollout of that Muslim man, that executive order, was disastrous. You know, in Vancouver, for example, we had, you know, that, we have a docket of interviews. That was my last posting, I'm sorry, at the consulate in Vancouver. You know, our consular officers and kind of all the employees there had pre-scheduled interviews for many of the nationals from the countries uh, from which travel was banned. That morning, they, many of them were caught mid-conversation with people when the news came in via cable, but even then, there was no forewarning. We had no idea this was coming. Mm. Uh, I, we might have even seen kind of the White House statement and then the cable. Mm. Um, I'll give you another example. You know, and this is an experience I've had personally, I think I'm absolutely sure many of my colleagues have had the same one. You know, every morning we kind of read our cable queue, this, again, this inbox of, of guidance straight out of State Department headquarters, drafted by, uh, or at least cleared by, with the direction of political appointees. Mm. And, you know, an example, a cable will contain talking points for the day, let's say, on trade. And I am you know, tasked with memorizing those talking points, you know, and finding meetings with senior foreign officials, delivering dutifully those talking points. And it has happened to me that in a meeting with a foreign official, kind of mid-sentence, that official that I'm talking to will pick up their cell phone and point to a tweet from the, uh, the, the president that directly contradicts what I'm saying in person. So. So, so talking points that the administration, the that State administration, Department, yeah. sends to you in the morning, sends the embassy in the morning, and you go and do your duty and start having a meeting about it with a foreign official, it, the president tweets in the middle of that meeting, coincidentally, and the foreign official says, you don't know what you're talking about. That's exactly right. Uh, or, you know, you know, it used to be the case that any pronouncements, any public statements by the president or the, the secretary of state, whether by Twitter, Facebook, uh, public statements, public remarks, are policy. And that was true under President Obama. If I saw him tweet something, if I saw a press, a statement on the White House website, I could repeat those. I didn't have to ask for permission. I knew that was my guidance. Under this president, that is not the case. Why did you want to write an op-ed and, and send a very strong message about why you were leaving? Um, so, you know, I've been asked a lot, of, uh, a bunch of times over the last uh, 24 hours whether I'm calling people out. Uh, the answer, the short answer is yes, but I'm not, calling out my former colleagues in the Foreign Service. Um, I'm not calling out other civil servants in, in the federal bureaucracy. They're doing their jobs and they're working hard. I am calling out, calling out the American people. Um, if you are concerned with what's coming out of this White House, if you're disgusted, dismayed by images of, again, children in squalid detention centers, if you don't like your president um, using rhetoric that emboldens white nationalists, then it's up to you to resist. And you can resist by protesting, you can publish an op-ed, uh, you can run for office, or you can vote. Um, and so I hope to do one or more of those things uh, now that I'm out of government. Mm -hmm. you, uh, you, you were in for 10 years. Uh, you were doing, you know, you knew what the job was. You knew that you would, might be working for administration that with different politics than your own. And plenty of people work for administrations with different politics. But if everybody resigned every time there was a new president, there would be chaos. I completely agree. So, you know, I'm not advocating that you know every president should bring in an entire new bureaucracy every time there's a transition. That would that would be chaos. Uh, and, and you would get people with no qualifications and no experience. That's right. I mean, the, yeah, as gross. much as people deride in this yeah. administration deride career civil servants, calling them bureaucrats, these are people who develop an expertise in what they're doing. Absolutely. So all I can say to respond to that question is that I couldn't do it anymore for myself. And to me, it felt like kind of this president and working for this president was an extreme, kind of frustrating, uh, kind of outrage-inducing experience, almost on a daily basis. And I'm referring more mostly to, to domestic policies and the, the foreign policies that I had to. The, the president often says, in the prior administration, uh, Peter, people around the world were laughing at us. No one's laughing at us now. Is that your experience? Because uh, I hear, I mean, in my travels overseas, 
I hear a lot of laughter, and it's not like laughing with us. I'm gonna be a little cute and respond to that. So, it's it's really I, I've been in meetings where the people didn't know that I was the U.S. diplomat in the room, and it's really interesting to hear what other nations say about us behind our backs when they think we're not listening. Mm. Um, and it's not all positive. They, there's still a belief in America. So let me reaffirm that. Um, and kind of just to, to, to circle back to kind of the core job of a foreign service officer, of a diplomat, is to, to represent America overseas, to explain it, and to defend America. I'm not sure right now that there's a coherent America to project to the world. There's an America I believe in, and I came home to fight for it.